uh, care of the housekeeping events. I want to welcome you again to the Chemistry Centre at the London headquarters of the Royal Society of Chemistry. For those of you who don't know what the Royal Society of Chemistry is, we are uh, the UK professional body for chemists with 48,000 members worldwide. We are an internationally renowned science publisher. We are the largest non-governmental supporter of chemical education in the UK and we are a charity. And we reinvest every penny we make back into advancing the chemical sciences. So with great pleasure, I can tell you that in the last decade, we have invested a quarter of a million, uh, sorry, more than that, 250 million pounds into the chemical sciences. And in the coming years, we hope to take that support of global chemistry to yet another level. We have offices in six countries. We have passionate, engaged uh, member groups in many more countries around the world. So one of the important ways the Royal Society of Chemistry supports the chemical sciences community is through recognizing outstanding contributions to the chemical sciences through our awards and our prizes. The Lord Lewis Prize, begun in 2008, is a highly prestigious Royal Society of Chemistry prize that recognizes an individual who has not only distinguished themselves in a research laboratory, but also in the corridors of power, with great impact in chemical science research and also science policy. Named for Baron Lewis of Newham, a member of the House of Lords and a chemist who has held lectureships at Sheffield, Imperial and Cambridge. The prize has previously been awarded to Robert May, Baron May of Oxford, and Professor Sir John Cadogan, and is kindly and proudly sponsored by Johnson Mathey. Tonight, I have the distinct pleasure of awarding the prize to its third recipient, Professor Sir David King. Sir David was, until recently, director of the Smith School of Enterprise and the Environment at the University of Oxford. He is Chancellor of the University of Liverpool, Senior Scientific Advisor to UBS, and Scientific Advisor to President Kabami of Rwanda. Born in South Africa in 1939, Sir David's early career took him from the University of Whitwatersrand, Imperial College London, and the University of East Anglia, to Liverpool, and then to Cambridge. Here he has held several positions of high esteem. He was the UK government's chief scientific advisor and head of the government office of science from October 2000 to December 2007. He has published over 500 papers on his research in chemical physics and on science policy. It is therefore my very great pleasure to award the Lord Lewis Prize for his seminal contribution to physical chemistry and his outstanding record as UK Chief Scientific Advisor to UK Government and Head of the Government Office for Science to Professor Sir David King. I can now sit down, which I'm sure you're all relieved about, uh, and we'll hear Sir David give his lecture entitled Renewable Energy and Nuclear Power for the UK. Sir David, please. Thank you. It's a particular honour to be delivering this lecture to you and to receive this prize. Um, I knew Jack Lewis for a very long time. I still know Jack Lewis, but he, we are friends going way back, and uh, he's a scientist who I admire totally. His work in inorganic chemistry 
got him almost every single chemical prize in the world that could be given for the sort of work he was doing. He was extraordinary in all that he did. And to be invited along and honor him in this way, of course, absolutely delightful. Also rather good to be in my own institution. I've spent a, a bit of time in what you've described as the corridors of power, and it's rather good to be back at home. So uh, thank you so much for honoring me in this way. As you can see from the, the opening slide, um, I'm very proud of the fact that I ran a series of world forums in uh, Oxford, uh, which were based around enterprise and the environment. And uh, we managed to attract uh, uh, really sparkling people along to those meetings. What you see here is on the left-hand side, the outgoing Secretary of State for Energy in the United States, Steve Chu, Nobel Prize winner in physics. And the guy in the middle is also perhaps recognizable by the mark on his forehead. And I worked closely with, uh, with uh, Mikhail Gorbachev uh, through his Green Cross International, which is a, a wonderful international organization that he began to set up before he left uh, what was then the Soviet Union. What I'm going to be talking to you about is the, the macro view of energy policy in the UK. And so in the first part of the talk, if you'll forgive me, it won't sound too close to energy, but you will see where I'm going, I think. I need to develop a very important theme, and the theme is that I don't think the United Kingdom can afford, economically afford, to go forward without defossilizing our uh, energy system. And in order to build up to that point, I need to introduce the wider subject instead of just going straight into energy policy. So here's what uh, I see as the, the key drivers for energy policy, and I suspect almost anyone would show a slide like this, uh, a very patriotic light bulb. And I, I think you'll see why, as I talk, I've put a patriotic light bulb up there. The energy security, if the lights go off, everybody knows the, the Secretary of State loses his job and quite possibly the Prime Minister loses his as well. Low carbon commitment, I will go into some detail on that. And then the third point, and the point that is, uh, is so poorly represented, is the, the economy. Why is it good for the economy? And I, I plan to, to deal with this, but again, placing it in context. So the first contextual position is the demographic position that we're in uh, uh, planet-wide. And the demographics are relatively simple. Uh, we entered the last century at one and a half billion people. We started adding a billion every 12 years, which I have to quickly say is a measure of our success in improving the well-being of people around the planet through that science, engineering, technology, medicine, innovation, market-facing products, wealth creation, and that circle, which has improved our well-being, measure it by lifespan improvement, and therefore, as that went around the world, by that increase in the uh, population. Now, perhaps this is more controversial, the population growth problem is no longer the issue. Uh, the number of under 15-year-olds today is the same as the number of under 15-year-olds there will be in 20 years' time, by which I mean that we have arrived at the point where the global average for female uh, fertility, the number of children per woman, is 2.1. Global average. And when I say to people that, they say that can't be true. Then I ask them to guess what the average is for a country such as Bangladesh. Bangladesh, 2.2 today. So the, the number of children per woman has fallen extremely rapidly alongside the business of female education and female empowerment. But what we're left with is that cohort growing through into my age group. And as they come into my age group, they replace a 1 billion cohort with a 2 billion. And there's the remaining growth that takes us up to mid-century and takes us from 7 billion to 9 billion. But then the big challenge is what is happening to the global middle class. So within the demographics, Look at this rapid rise in the middle class. One billion 
just 12 years ago, it's now reaching 2 billion. By middle class, I'm simply saying those who spend two, 10 to $100 a day on consumer goods very largely, consuming, commodity prices going up. That's what's driving commodity prices up on the one hand, and on the other hand, it's resource scarcity. So we've got a collision between demand and supply, and that is the key issue in terms of the economics, and a key issue that is so often ignored in our media, and that is a remaining puzzle to me. The result of this, this, the driver of demographics and the rise in the middle class is the key. Again, improved well-being spreading around the world. We need to welcome that. But the challenges are coming at us all at once as a result of this. So whether we look at energy security and supply, which is what I'm going to focus on today, or the other issues here, fresh water supply, uh, food production for that number of people, minerals, availability of minerals, now, people who say, well, there's an infinite supply of these things effectively, ignore the fact that there is a cost associated with retrieval. So what happens is that easy fruit is, has already been taken. If we take minerals, the, the mines with large veins, largely mined out. We can go on retrieving minerals. We can go on retrieving oil, but the cost goes spiraling upwards, and that's why we're seeing this rapid rise in uh, commodity prices. Now, amongst these challenges, of course, is climate change. And the problem with all of this is, this is a many-body problem, if I may use the physics term in a chemistry society. This is a many-body problem, because if we tackle water resource, as they started doing in so southern Australia, by deionizing, de sorry, by desalinating seawater, reverse osmosis, energy intensive, we switch around to energy security, lots of coal, burn coal to make water, or if you're in Saudi Arabia, burn oil to make water, and bingo, you, you cause the climate change effect that you're trying to deal with gets worse. And so what we need is what has been described as a systems analysis. We need to look at all parts of this equation. And the key there is, who's the we in the sentence we need to look at it together. That's the big challenge. It's a collective problem, and it requires good, broad thinking on a global scale to manage it. And that's why we may be in real difficulty moving forward. But there is reason for optimism, and I am an optimist. So let me come back to you with that. So first of all, climate change. I see that as the biggest challenge of all of these. Uh, for those of you who have uh, worried a little bit about what the skeptics are saying, I'm just producing here um, undoctored data. This is data taken from, by the Proudman Institute from all those people who were gathering sea level measurements in the times of the British Empire. They simply measured under very standard conditions uh, around the whole planet what the sea levels were doing. And they've, they, so they've got a coherent bunch of data showing that sea levels are rising. Now, I was describing this to a skeptic who said to me, but I'm talking about climate change. Why are you talking about sea levels? And I had to explain how a thermometer works. The expansion of liquid produces a rise in the thermometer. We can take temperature measurements, and that's shown in red 10 yearly averages, and there from that we, we understand. The expansion of the water is a very good proxy for temperature rise. The air temperature measurements bounce around as you would expect from a low density fluid. So the rise in temperature that we've seen of 0.8 degrees centigrade is rather better demonstrated by the sea level rise that's already happened. Now, of course, that rise is so far due to thermal expansion, ice added to it is going to be the future uh, rapid increase that, uh, that we're very likely to see in the, in the near future. When I was in government, I was able to call upon people to do various things for me. It was a, a wonderful calling club that I had. And so when we hit that very hot summer in Central Europe in 2003, and it's estimated 35,000 fatalities, uh, the biggest single uh, natural disaster in Central Europe is represented by that 
temperature excursion shown in black in 2003 here, not reported as a natural disaster because it took place over a month instead of over a day as with a tsunami. Now, what I got them to do was simply to run the Met Office climate model, which had now incorporated into it the Hadley uh, global warming uh, models, and just asked them to run backwards in time to see how well the red curve, the theory curve, explained the behavior of the, the black curve, the actual experimental observation of average European temperatures, and that didn't look too bad, and then to run forward in time to see what, uh, what the future prognosis looks like. Now, this isn't a very happy slide, and you don't often get to see it. Uh, you'll see that the temperature rise showing here is considerably higher than the 2 to 4 degrees centigrade that you hear talked about by the end of the century. Interestingly, um, the, the black uh, line actually lies a little above the red, so uh, th this uh, is actually showing a rather conservative view of the temperature change that's uh, already occurred. This may well be the, the difference in solar activity on its 11-year cycle that is uh, bringing that dif difference about. So what, what we see is that these models were predicting that by mid-century, 2050, the average temperature, just take a, a vertical slice across there, I think I have a, a device here. If you take a vertical slice here, the average temperature in Central Europe by 2050 will be the same as that exceedingly hot temperature in Central Europe. By far the hottest on record. This is the previous 1947 high temperature in Central Europe. The baseline increase is essentially the reason. The, the excursion isn't much larger than this one, but the baseline increase is what makes the impact that much worse. There's the challenge we're faced with. We have agreed within the European Union, and we've agreed at many international meetings, that we should avoid going up this curve all the way up here. That's what my talk is really centered about. Now, there's another side to it, and I'm coming now to the economy. And we've published a few papers from uh, the Schmidt School at Oxford, and uh, one of them is just taking a look at conventional oil reserves and how we are burning the oil, and then doing a simple extrapolation forward. So this is discovery of oil fields year on year, and this is the demand for oil and therefore the oil that has been burnt as a function of time. And of course, discovery, we all know, peaked around 1970 and has been uh, falling since then. Um, uh, however, of course, demand is on a, an uprise. Uh, th this is the action of OPEC that uh, caused that hiccup in, in uh, rise. Now, <clears throat> I just included here, going forward, the International Energy Agency forecast for continued demand for oil. But what I'm showing you is crude oil uh, production. And, and what you see is our extrapolation forward, based on a very simple fact, everyone here will know this, that the area under the red curve cannot exceed the area under the black curve. Uh, but a second fact that we've included in this extrapolation forward is that as oil is depleted from a reservoir, it becomes more difficult to, to get the oil out. And so we've included that in the timeline going forward. And this, uh, this means that there's an increasing gap with effect from 2010 between supply and demand. Now, why am I only talking about crude oil? Uh, the reason is because crude oil is what is cheap. That's what comes springing out of the ground when you uh, break through uh, a rock formation that contains oil. Other oil, uh, whether it's ta from tar sands treating with methane and steam to make oil, or from two miles down in the Gulf of Mexico, is not included here. But of course, this gap is already being met by going to these alternative sources. The result is that we are past the days of cheap oil. And so we're not going to see a return to uh, cheap oil going forward is the prediction from this analysis here. Here's a, a, curve, a, a curve that we managed to publish in Nature. Let me say this was quite a surprise to us. Any, any scientist would see that we're plotting something that is showing a phase transition at this point. Um, and what we're actually plotting is millions of barrels of crude oil production. There's no time in line in this. 
millions of barrels of crude oil production as a function of world spot price. This is actually the Brent crude price. And what you see is that it went up from $15 a barrel at around 64.5 million barrels a day to around 70, when we were producing just under 74 million barrels a day, went up to about $40 a barrel. That's what economists call elastic supply and demand. Demand increasing and the price is, is being driven up by that increasing demand. But then something interesting happens. The price jumps with not much. You see that we've never produced more than 75 million barrels a day, but the price leapt up to $140 a barrel. Now the price has been bouncing up and down here. I did look at today's price. It's somewhere up here now. now the point here I'm making is that we have hit a wall in crude oil production, which is what the previous slide was showing. This is just a very dramatic demonstration of that. And now I can tell you that all of the data points in blue precede 2005 and in black are after 2005. So the turning point in crude oil production was 2005. The price of the most expensive oil to meet that gap going onto the market, perhaps from Gulf of Mexico, perhaps from elsewhere, determines the global price for oil. Nobody is going to charge less simply because the oil is still leaping out of the ground. So we're all having to pay this high price to meet that marginal gap that is widening up going forward. That's why I'm saying the price cannot go down again. Now, what, what does that do to our economies? And again, I'm simply surprised that this isn't the biggest item on the agenda of governments like ours. We all know, don't we, that the Italian economy has gone belly up or pear-shaped or however you, you want to describe it. What I'm showing here is that actually back in the period 92, 93, the, the uh, Italian economy was in the black. When they joined the euro, the e Italian economy was in the black to about 1 billion euro per annum. They then joined the, the euro, and this is often blamed, and going forward in time, they're now in, in the red to about 40 billion euro per annum. That's their economy apparently going belly up. However, 100% of the deficit in the Italian economy is the increased cost of oil, imported oil, to Italy. 100% is 40 billion euro per annum is the current cost, increased cost, of imported oil to Italy. They are importing less oil because there's less usage, there's more efficient cars, etc. But nevertheless, they're having to pay this much higher price indicated by my previous slide. Now, you, you could perhaps rest easy and say, well, we've got North Sea gas and oil. Um, at maximum, we were producing 3.1 million barrels a day, and we use about 1.7 million barrels a day, usage fairly stable. Uh, well, we're now down below 1.5 million barrels a day, so we were selling oil out of country when it was going at $15 a barrel. That was our excess, and now we're buying it in at between $110 and $140 a barrel. What is that doing to our deficit? Our, I'm using the old word, balance of payments. We're estimating that last year, for the first time, it was approaching 80% of our annual deficit is our dependence on imported oil. And this, uh, I, but that figure includes the loss of revenues over the same period as we're dealing with Italy, the loss of revenues from exported oil. So we, in other words, in order to manage a balance, Italy, France, Britain, all of these net oil importers need to increase their exports of manufactured goods and services just to be standing still on the economy. That's uh, the, the critical point I want to make here. And therefore, the, the therefore is the faster we can unhook ourselves from oil dependence and from dependence of imported energy, the more quickly we can get our economy back on stream. Dear Chancellor, there's a letter in there somewhere. Uh, this is, uh, I think, a, a critically important point. 
Now, just to back up what I was saying about commodity prices, this is a basket of commodity prices, including energy, food, and minerals, produced uh, uh, the MGI index, uh, um, which it's a good basket. And what you see here is if the if take the index as um, uh, 100 in uh, the 1990s, uh, we've now uh, reached up above uh, 240. Now, when food prices increased a factor of three, which is in there, I suspect people in this room barely noticed it. Food, 5% of our GDP. But when you look at a country like Egypt, where food was 80% of GDP, you get a very different response. And I think anyone who's analyzing the Arab Spring needs to understand that when people can no longer afford the food they need to eat, then there are, are, are problems arising. Now, what is astonishing about this curve is that since 2007, we've had what can only be described as a recession or a failure in, uh, in growth of our economies in the West. What happened in the late 20s, early 30s, accompanying the crash in the economy, was a dramatic fall in commodity prices. Of course, that was an engine for regrowth of the economy. The overproduction of the commodities meant that goods could be sold at a much cheaper price, and this was an engine for regrowth. I'm not saying the engine, but an engine which is not available to us this time. And the reason comes back to the growth in the middle classes. Middle classes suddenly doubling and due to go up to a five-fold increase. They're approaching five billion in the year 2030. That is what is pulling prices up, is the continued demand from that rapidly growing middle class. The more we can develop in country, the better off we will be. And I think that's a, a key message. Use that enormous strength we have in the science space to recreate that science technology, innovation, wealth creation agenda, but move it in a lean, green manufacturing direction. Move it towards a circular economy where we manage our own economy by reusing, remanufacturing goods. We need to look at what's happening in China. The Chinese developed a scientific outlook on development back in 2003. I was one of those who was drawn over to China by the uh, uh, Premier Wen Jiabao, who asked me to advise them. I didn't quite realize the magnitude of what I was involved in. And now, the final up, uh, uh, outcome of all of this is that China in, in November has changed the constitution of the Communist Party, which is binding on the government, not commented on in our newspapers. And that change is what? to introduce what they've been working on, the scientific outlook on development, and in that new <coughs> constitution, the last major change was when uh, uh, Mao died and they introduced the principles of the market system into their economy. So this is a dramatic moment. They've introduced the principles of the circular economy. They're talking about the eco-civilization that they need to move towards. They need to move towards that Chinese proverb, bringing people back into harmony with nature. And that, that is all now written in, and this week being re-established into their uh, principles going forward for the new uh, leadership. Now, where do we want to be, and I will get round to nuclear in a moment, uh, where do we want to be uh, going forward? Back in government, these, this is the curve we produced. Uh, going forward, we needed to stabilize, we felt, at 450 parts per million, basically because we thought it was doable. We're now rapidly approaching 400 parts per million. When I say rapidly, it's increasing at about two parts per million per annum. So, uh, can we manage to get on this curve? Well, I've redrawn this curve here because the downturn in the global economy did produce a hiccup in CO2 emissions. So this is now the business as usual. What is required to get down there? Well, if you go to 2050, you'll see that we need globally to be sitting at about 18 
billion tons of carbon dioxide emission across the whole planet. I've shown you we expect to have 9 billion people. Divide 18 by 9 and you get 2 tons per person per annum. That's the allowance that we persuaded government to take on board and that is the 80% reduction from the 10 tons per person per annum to 2 tons per person per annum. That's the origin of the uh, argument for the policy change. Originally 60% reduction and then 80%. Now, let's look at how we can manage that. We take a look at the energy consumption by sector. This happens to be global, but it's a fair description of the UK position as well. I've pulled transport out and I'll explain why I've pulled it out. We've got 28% uh, from industry, 24% residential, 9% services and 12% the rest. If we look at this problem as simply one of energy production onto the electricity grid, I will show you that we're not going to be able to manage the problem because much of the energy consumption by sector here is not off the electricity grid at the moment. And a big part of that chunk is transport. Even when we look at the railway system, only roughly 50% of our uh, railway system is, uh, is on electricity. The rest is still on diesel. We are burning diesel to pull trains around, even now at these oil prices I've indicated. All these are win-wins as we switch over in economic terms. So, UK energy policy, what, uh, what does that policy involve? First of all, that commitment to 80% CO2 reduction by 2050, a commitment accepted with only five votes against in the House of Commons. So there was an all-party agreement to, to go down this route, a bit of competition between the parties about we are going further than you, which was a marvellous position to be in. Then we go to the European Union. We introduced a cap and trade in Britain one year ahead of the European Union to see that we can get it all managed and up and running. Uh, the formation of the Department of Energy and Climate Change, I think that was a, a, a smart move and I have to say that I was involved in pushing for that particular uh, grouping to be brought together. So pulling climate change out of DEFRA and putting it in with energy and creating a new department. Energy had been downplayed since privatization. And what needed to happen was to revamp energy into a department aligned with climate change. Formation of the Climate Change Committee. Parliament therefore taking over and seeing that there was a committee that could a oversee the process and in particular create four yearly carbon budgets. The industry investing in low carbon energy wants to see long-term futures in these low-carbon energies. So we knew we had to have carbon budgets going forward in time and the present carbon budgets take us out to 2024. Energy efficiency measures, absolutely key. And that applies to housing and transport and government has been pursuing uh, these measures. So there's the policy and I'm going to suggest to you that the policy, despite how attractive it might look to you here, remains rather incoherent and uh, at times has been uh, uh, fairly critically so. So let's, uh, let's take a look at the energy supply options. We know what the objective is. We need to have a virtually carbon-free economy by mid-century and we need to develop the full range of supply options. So, um, I'm saying don't pick winners. Let's, uh, let's see how each of these options works out in the marketplace, but not just passively see. We have to regulate, we have to create obligation. We, the government, need to be engaged fully in that process to see that the right actions emerge. The strategy, therefore, requires coherent planning, strong science and engineering base, so let me stress that. If we are going to benefit from the new green economy that emerges, we have to be leaning into our R&D base, which has all this strength, and we need to see to it that the R&D base is positioned to deliver. And I think the uh, EPSERC, for example, the research councils, have been rather well focused on this. 
Uh, and so what we see across the country is an amazing array of new developments emerging from our research base. We do have that uh, strength. What we need to do is see that we can position the UK as a leader in this low carbon energy process and manufacturing going forward in time. And I don't think we can sit back and be passive in that process. I do think it requires engagement of government. Now let me just uh, present to you some analysis that, um, that we conducted and, uh, and published last year. Um, uh, all credit for modeling uh, goes to the, the models produced in DEC by their uh, wonderful chief scientific advisor, uh, David Mackay, um, uh, an engineer from Cambridge and uh, delighted when he took the job. Uh, absolutely one of the country's leading experts in uh, energy production. So this is using the DEC models which have become freely available to all of us and saying, okay, let's, let's look at UK energy demand going forward in the first place. And we took a number of different scenarios and we're just showing two of them here. The business as usual is to see that transport, heating and cooling, industry, lighting and appliances continue much under the distribution that they have now, and we see a rising UK energy demand going forward in time. The second one is where energy efficiency and electrification are pushed at strongly. Now, what, what does that mean? It means that the built environment is using less energy for heating and lighting, and it, the electrification means that we're moving the transport sector onto the electricity grid. So on the one hand, there's a saving in electricity, and on the other hand, and, and uh, heating, I should add, in there, and on the other hand, we're seeing a, a rising cost as we remove the transport sector from its dependence on imported oil. And so, surprisingly, perhaps, what we see is that the second scenario has uh, um, effectively a virtually constant energy demand going forward in time. This is a relief, I, I've no doubt, to the utilities, but the important point is from a, it's very cost-effective to go down a route that involves pressure on energy efficiency in both transport and housing and in terms of the uh, transport sector electrification. Take it off oil dependence. Now, the business as usual, we see a 33% increase in energy use out to 2050, whereas the, the other is actually showing an, a decrease in energy use, but a big increase in electricity use because of that switch uh, in usage. And then we've, we've looked at UK energy supply, and uh, this is business as usual with nuclear, hydroelectricity, and carbon capture and storage. And this is now taking scenario A, where we have to meet a rising uh, electricity demand going forward in time. And then we see that it only reduces carbon emissions by 73% uh, by 1990. I challenge anyone to use these models and get a better figure than that. So the important thing is we can't deliver without the efficiency benefits and the electrification of the, uh, of, of the uh, transport sector. Carbon emissions on uh, uh, A just can't be brought down. We now go to different UK energy supply scenarios for scenario B, where the energy is constant but electricity demand goes up. So this is now how we can provide that increased demand for electricity. And we are using here a range of unabated thermal generation. Um, uh, that, that is phasing out fossil fuels as we go forward in time without abatement of CO2. In blue is the abatement with abatement of CO2. Um, nuclear power in green and carbon capture and storage is obviously the abatement side of that. Onshore wind, offshore wind included in the two different scenarios to a different extent. But you'll see that there's no big reliance in our models going forward on uh, wind Beyond, much beyond the uh, current uh, projected capacity. Carbon emissions reduced under B1 by 16% and in B2 by 15%. So what, what we see is that we're achieving the objective provided we go down this 
much more holistic route of managing energy demand going forward. Now, I want to just say a few words about nuclear and why I think this is particularly apposite for the UK. Uh, the argument is the following, that we have accumulated around uh, six, 7,000 tons of uranium, so-called spent uranium, and we have accumulated about 105 tons of plutonium up in Cumbria. Looking back in time, in 2003, I sat on a subcommittee of, uh, uh, of the Cabinet Committee uh, producing a white paper on energy. And that white paper suddenly, about a week before publication, had a chapter removed from it, and that chapter was a very big chunk of our future energy under the heading nuclear. And there was some disagreement between one of the secretaries of state in particular, I think, uh, no secret, it was Margaret Beckett, and the Prime Minister, and the Prime Minister backed away. So suddenly we had a white paper that didn't add up. And as a result, we also have, and I, it may be a result, but I believe it is a result, we were no longer then going to build new nuclear power stations, so we set up a nuclear decommissioning authority. We still have a nuclear decommissioning authority, and my argument is, but I thought we changed policy in 2007 with another white paper in which we said we would build new nuclear power stations. The Nuclear Decommissioning Authority owns all of the uranium and plutonium. And the intention is, therefore, to treat it as a waste. Now, our argument is there's an alternative, and that is to treat that as a fuel and go straight into new nuclear build to burn it. And so we did an analysis and again published, and we published a bunch of scenarios going forward. Very difficult with economics uh, uh, because we, we didn't really know what discount rates were most apposite going forward, so we used a wide range. I'm just going to show you one set going forward. So this is treating all of that stuff as waste and going forward in time, converting the uh, uranium and plutonium, plutonium into mixed oxide and therefore uh, passivating the use of plutonium for uh, uh, nuclear weaponry and then burying the uh, uh, MOX that was created in that process. And so this is the total cost to the UK that we're estimating going forward. And you see that we're going forward for a very long time. A lot of that fuel is very hot. Uh, and you'll see that the, the cost in the shorter term, out to 2050, amounts to around five billion pounds, uh, but a much larger cost going forward in time. And of course, what I'm now coming to is a comparison. If instead of treating that as a waste, we treat that as a fuel, we reprocess the uranium, uh, we make mixed oxide with the plutonium and burn that as a fuel, so we get rid of these hot uh, uh, wastes, and at the same time we're producing electricity. So we get, the curve in brown here, a net cost reduction which is very substantial because we get an income from the sale of fuel. Now, the, the current uh, price that the government is negotiating with EDF for, uh, for fuel would actually push our curve for income from sales way above the, the uh, uh, price indicated here. So the, the amount of money achieved from the sales of the fuel are dependent, of course, on the, the price per kilowatt hour of the electricity produced and therefore the price that the companies can afford to pay for the, uh, for the fuel that emerges from the process. So, what we're doing is saying simply the UK is in a unique position. We have all of this uranium and plutonium there which we can use as a fuel. We don't have to import any more. This is also an argument for the UK being used as a launch pad for generation three and four nuclear power stations in which reprocessing is effectively built in. So what, what we see is that we're in a position here to roll nuclear out major economic benefit to the UK, we meet that requirement going forward that we're taking electricity onto the transport sector but we're paying for it within country with a resource that's in country instead of 
buying oil, gas and coal from abroad to manage our energy production. The IPPR report that came out just a few days ago, and I think Will Self and his team has done a very good job, came to very similar conclusions to ourselves, but I just encapsulate their uh, findings here. New nuclear energy capacity, they reckon, would boost the UK GDP by up to 0.34% per annum over a period of 15 years. And you'll see that it would also generate at least 32,500 uh, jobs annually. Um, the annual exports from the nuclear industry could also be increased in this process. So there are strong economic arguments for going down this route. So the, the conclusion I reach, we have been manipulating, playing with, talking about figures as to how much is required to keep the lights on in the UK going forward in time. When I was talking on, uh, to people on, on that uh, generating the white paper in 2003, I was arguing that we had a, a window of opportunity between 2014, 2013 and 2020 when much of our energy generating power stations, nuclear and other, would have to be decommissioned. That window of opportunity, we said, should be grabbed to go down this agenda. We're still sitting there waiting for that opportunity to be grabbed. We haven't yet seen the investment of this order of, of funds. And when I spoke to a House of Commons Select Committee fairly recently and they said, well, where do you think the money would come from? I said, well, it seems to me that quantitative easing has been very successful in refloating banks, but not in a way that has benefited our economy. What about directed quantitative easing, in which we invest in the future of the company and a country and at the same time stimulate the economy out of its current doldrums. So I do think there's another factor that needs to be stressed here. Without an investment of this order of magnitude, we're not going to produce the electricity that the country requires going forward. A decision needs to be made which isn't simply the cheapest option is to build new gas-fired turbines. That is a, a, a philosophy of hope based on a massive amount of fracking gas that has suddenly become available in the United States and brought gas prices down there. I think it's very, very optimistic to anticipate that gas fracking is going to have much of an impact in the UK going forward. And I certainly wouldn't want to see our energy policy based on that. Does the market provide these solutions? Well, in 1990, UK gas and electricity pri privatized. There was the experiment. Energy white paper in 2003, um, I've already mentioned, but 2007, another energy white paper, this time including nuclear. But we can have all the white papers we like, but if there isn't a direction from the cabinet, if there isn't a direction agreed on by the Prime Minister and those people in number 11, I don't see how this is going to be taken forward. What it quite clearly requires is a coherent view across the whole cabinet of what is needed to keep the lights on. And I'm simply proposing here that we need a new large-scale energy infrastructure authority. I'm not saying just for nuclear, by any means. I happen to be a fan of, um, of building across the seven a barrage that will generate an average of three gigawatts of electricity. That'll put a large number of people to work it would also keep producing electricity probably for the next four or five hundred years. Uh, we, the cost of maintaining a barrage to produce electricity is not high. So what we're doing is investing in the future. The problem is, and I challenge the economists, how do you manage an investment that is going to have a payback time of that sort of length? Uh, you wouldn't invest in anything beyond 20 years with a discount rate of four and a half percent which is what the Treasury used in looking at the seven barrages as a project. By the time it's built, effectively, you've written it off as a, a zero value to the country. So I'll leave you with that thought, but with one more. I talked about transport, and I talked about how we energize transport, and I just want to show you that there are a number of amazing things happening in Britain, in our universities and in our private sector companies. So I just have two pictures left. One is 
my favorite little car being produced. It doesn't look terribly different from every other car. This is produced by Gordon Murray Designs. Gordon Murray, the great engineer who produced 50 Formula One winning cars and, uh, and finally ended his career producing the McLaren road car. That's his car on the left, uh, 6,000 pounds a pop. But the crucial thing is he doesn't mind what engine you put in it. Electric driven, it could be petrol driven. He does 100 miles per gallon uh, uh, on a petrol driven. It's a very fast car. He is a Formula One designer. Uh, when it goes to the market, it has to be geared down because it's a very light car. It's essentially made of plastic. It's made of drawn plastic. And the, the total chassis of the car has no bolts in it. This is breaking away from the Model T Ford process of manufacturing a car. The entire chassis, one piece, produced in 45 seconds on the manufacturing process. And by the time you've slapped on the plastic covers and the engine and the wheels, you're driving it away within three or four minutes. So he, the, the whole process is being transformed for car manufacturing here in Britain. And my remaining example is, and what do we do about flying? I've been pushing the idea of lighter than aircraft for some time, and hybrid lighter than aircraft using the advantages we've learned about from uh, normal aircraft. And I'm very pleased to tell you that the Department of Defense in the United States put up half a billion dollars as a contract for a company that would make lighter than aircraft uh, half a billion dollars for five, uh, and a British company, hybrid aircraft, a British company, uh, hybrid aircraft, has built this and delivered it to the United States. This is transformative. This, I believe, is going to take the form of both freight transport and person transport in, in Africa first, as the mobile phone in banking has taken place in Africa first, but it, our calculation in moving tomatoes from Spain to Britain instead of in the 747 wide belly is to use this 10 times cheaper, delivery time quicker, because you simply lower the container of tomatoes onto the roof of the Sainsbury's depot and the next one onto the roof of Tesco's. It's a relatively easy thing to do, to keep the craft in the air, constantly positioned, and uh, uh, raise and lower the goods. Transformative, because as shown here, it doesn't require any infrastructure on the ground. We are seeing the future emerging, and I think Britain needs to make sure that it positions itself to benefit from these developments. Thank you. Indeed, that was a fantastic lecture.